I am here today because I'm a survivor of the Holocaust. I am a survivor, but only just, because I was born in a concentration camp right at the end of the Second World War. But that comes right at the end of my story. And I start my story with this map. This is a map that shows all the main concentration camps and certainly all the death camps that existed in Nazi-occupied Europe during the Second World War. As I said, it doesn't show all of them because there were hundreds and hundreds of camps. Everywhere where you see the swastika, the Nazi emblem, there you see a name and that name indicates either a transit camp, a slave labor camp, a concentration camp or a death camp. And the three camps that my family were involved in are the three names you can see in boxes. The first one is called Theresienstadt, which is the German word for a town in the country that used to be called Czechoslovakia and is now called the Czech Republic. It means the town of Theresa. It was named after former empress of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Maria Theresa. The second place you will have probably heard of, it's the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp in Poland. But the third one I doubt whether you've heard of, and that is in Mauthausen in Austria. Now there's a second reason why I use this particular map, and that is to bring to your attention the inset in the circle in the top left hand corner, where you can see a map of part of the British Isles. And there you can also see a swastika. The swastika is over the Channel Islands, over Jersey and Guernsey and Alderney, because they were invaded by the Germans, there were Jewish people living there, and they were either imprisoned on the islands or they were sent to concentration camps in Europe. So that shows how closely the whole thing came to mainland Britain. Now, because I'm telling you a family story, it comes naturally to me to show you family photographs. And this is a photograph of my German family. My father was German, German but Jewish. It was, a, I gather, a family group that took place every summertime uh, outside Berlin. Five people who were highlighted from that same photograph. The adults in the background uh, were my grandparents with their three children in the foreground. And my father is the little boy on the right hand side. Now in 1933, when Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany, all those three children by then were grown up. They were all grown up and they all realized that it would be advisable if they could get out of Germany. And the first one to leave was my uncle Rolf. He left Germany and first he went to live in Holland where he met and married a Dutch lady who was also Jewish. And when the Germans invaded Holland, they managed to escape to Switzerland, Switzerland being a neutral country during the Second World War. And after the war, my uncle was very proud of this photograph. He would say to us, you know, look at me in GI uniform in front of, in quotes, my Jeep. So they were safe. My father's sister, Marga, she and her husband are my cousin. They left Germany quite late in December of 1938. But nevertheless, they managed to get on a ship that was headed uh, for Sydney in Australia. So they were safe. My own father, he left Germany in 1933 and he managed to get to Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia. He thought that was far enough to be, face, uh, to be safe. It wasn't. But if he hadn't have come to Prague, he wouldn't have met my mother and I would not be talking to you now. Now, I like to think of this as being my sort of star photograph. I hope you might agree with me by the time you've seen them all. This is a photograph of my parents on their wedding day. They were married on the 15th of May, 1940, which was already under Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia. My father had been an architect and interior designer. And when he first came to Prague, he managed to get a job working for a furniture manufacturer. And initially he was employed to build film sets at the Brandoff Film Studios, which are still there. My mother had been a law student at the Charles University, but when the Germans invaded, they closed all the Czech universities. Nobody was allowed to study. So she decided she was going to try to find a job that had more sort of immediate practical use. And she decided to become apprentice to a milliner. Now you may well think that that wasn't a very practical job because a milliner is a hat maker. Uh, and nowadays, very few people wear hats. But in the 1940s, women always wore hats, even if they just went down to the local shops. 
Now, when the Germans invaded any country, they immediately imposed various rules and regulations upon Jewish people. And there are hundreds and hundreds of those rules and regulations, and they all come under the general heading of the Nuremberg Laws. I will mention just a few. First and foremost, Jewish people immediately lost their citizenship. They were no longer allowed to vote. Jewish people were immediately thrown out of the professions. They could no longer be doctors, lawyers, teachers. No intermarriage was allowed between Jewish people and those of other faiths. Uh, Jewish children were immediately expelled from mainstream schools. There was a curfew. Jews were not allowed to go out in the evening. They were only allowed to go shopping at certain times of the day, invariably the late afternoon, when there would have been as little fresh produce available as possible. Jewish people were no longer allowed to keep animals. They had to hand them in. They were no longer allowed to keep their cars or their bicycles. They were no longer allowed to keep their telephones or their radios. They were also forbidden to go to parks, swimming pools, theatres, concerts, cinemas. All those things were forbidden. Their lives were meant to be more and more restricted within their own communities. But because these restrictions happened very gradually, people tended to think, you know, well, this is, if this is the worst it's going to get, we can cope with this, we can live with this. But by the same token, sometimes some people would test these restrictions. And, you know, I think it's a very common human reaction. I'm sure you've all experienced it. I know I have. If you're told you're forbidden to do something, well, your gut reaction is to go and do it. <clears throat> One of the main restrictions imposed upon Jewish people was the fact they were no longer allowed to go to parks, swimming pools, theatres, concerts, cinemas. And one day my mother decided she was going to go to the cinema and she was sitting in the cinema watching the film. When the Gestapo came in, the secret police, they came in, they stopped the film and they started to go through the audience row by row looking at their ID papers. And my mother was terrified. She had no idea how they would react when they got to her and when they saw the large J for Jew on her papers. And they got to about halfway through the auditorium and they stopped, but they left the cinema. And they had stopped just one row in front of where she'd been sitting. And boy, did she breathe a sigh of relief. And ever since she told me about this, I was always trying to get her to remember what on earth the film was that made her take such a risk. She also would have dearly liked to know what it was, but it was such a frightening experience, and it was the first. Far worse was to come, but she didn't know that. It was such a frightening experience that um, she blanked out that memory, and she never remembered. But what I can tell you is that when we first came to this country, and when I was safely in school trying to learn English as quickly as possible, I think my mother used to go to the cinema almost every single day. And that was fantastic light relief for her after her wartime experiences. She just had this need, it was almost like an obsession to catch up with the frivolous things of life. Now, one of the later restrictions that you may well know about was the fact that Jewish people had to wear a yellow star. And this is a photograph of my mother's older sister, Zena, and her friend, Herbert. And I do have a genuine yellow star with me. This is a genuine yellow star. It has the word Jude on it, which means Jew in German. And everybody had to wear the yellow star every time they went outside their own front door. You had to buy as many yellow stars as there were members of the family aged six and above. And my mother distinctly remembered what she was wearing the first time she ever had to wear one of these. A dark green skirt, tan suede jacket, hat gloves, and she was going to the shops. She said it actually didn't look that bad on the suede jacket. But nevertheless, she was very, very apprehensive because she had no idea how people might react to her. But every time my mother went outside wearing the yellow star, nothing ever happened. People just ignored it. And that was the best possible news. Nobody pointed at her. Nobody laughed at her. Nobody was rude to her. Nobody spat at her. All those things happened to other people, but it never happened to my mother. We speculated why not. And all she could think was, you know, she was a young woman and she was full of self-confidence and she wasn't going to be cowed. She wasn't going to be bullied by anybody. And I think the fact she wasn't a bad looker must have helped. There's a second reason why I use this particular photograph, and that is simply to show you they are smiling. They are smiling because they were out before curfew. They were engaged to be married. They were happy. 
And I assume at the instant that the photograph was taken, they had forgotten that they were wearing the yellow star with any implication that it might have for them in the future. And I'll tell you what happened to them later on. My mother had another sister and her name was Ruja. Ruja means Rose. And this is my aunt Rose with my cousin Peter when he was about five. And the next photograph shows you Peter a bit older with a photograph of his father, my Uncle Tom. Once again, I wonder if any of you know what the uniform is. He's actually wearing the British Army uniform. And the reason for that is, in 1939, he managed to escape from occupied Czechoslovakia. He got to the UK, he joined the Free Forces. He also managed to get a visa for his wife and for his child. But tragically, my aunt refused to come. And the reason she refused to come was because Basically, it was a very unhappy marriage. And she said to her husband, she said, no, we'll be fine. We'll stay with my parents, with her parents, my grandparents. And that was the attitude of an awful lot, I would say, the majority of Jewish people in occupied countries. Because initially, they had no idea at all that they might be sent away anywhere, let alone to something called a slave labor camp, a concentration camp, or a death camp. They had no idea. They just thought if they kept a low pro profile, more or less stuck to those rules and regulations, you know, they'd be okay. That's human nature. You hope for the best. And again, I'll tell you what happened to them later on. Now, this is an aerial photograph of this place called Terezin or Terezinstadt. It is about 40 miles outside of Prague, and before the war, it was a garrison town where Czech soldiers were stationed. But when the Germans invaded, the Czech army was um, disbanded. And the Germans turned this place into a ghetto and a concentration camp. And Jewish people from all over Europe were sent there in their thousands. And when I was growing up, I was asking my mother, you know, how, how are you taking prisoner? Because I had various images in my mind. I'd read the diary of Anne Frank, I'd seen films, I'd seen documentaries. And I had this image in my mind that perhaps, you know, the middle of one night, three o'clock in the morning, there would have been soldiers banging on the door, soldiers with guns and dogs dragging people out of their beds. And I said to her, you know, is that what happened to you? And she said, no, nothing like that. We received a card in the post. And the card said that on a certain day at a certain time, we would have to report to a warehouse in Prague near one of the mainland railway stations. And that's what happened. My father, at the end of November, beginning of December of 1941, my father received his card and he left. You were told you could take a small suitcase, you were advised to take warm clothing. You were also advised to take a few pots and pans, which indicated to them that they would be, be sent somewhere where they'd be able to cook, they'd be able to look after themselves, and they assumed that they were being sent to some sort of labor camp. And a few days later, my mother received her card and she left. And not only was she carrying her handbag and her suitcase, she was also carrying a large cardboard box. And I said to her, what on earth did you have in the box? Didn't you have enough to worry about, enough to carry? And she said, well, I think I had between two or three dozen donuts in the box. And I said, why donuts? And she said, well, your father liked donuts. And it was a very sensible thing to do, as she had no idea where the next meal was coming from. So she was bringing food, just happened to be donuts. And I said to her, did they get to him? She said, yes, they weren't terribly fresh anymore, but they're perfectly edible and he was pleased. Now, my mother had to spend three days and three nights in that warehouse with hundreds and hundreds of other people. They weren't given much food or water. They had to sleep on the floor. And at the end of those three days, they were marched to the railway station. And the route was lined with young German officers, 18, 20 year olds. And there was one young German officer who knew he had a bit of power and he wielded it. He didn't harm my mother physically. He was just a bit sarcastic with words. I will say what he said in German. I will then translate it. I apologize for the swear word, but it's what he said. This German could see that my mother was having great difficulty mainly carrying the box with the, with the donuts. Because, you know, after three days, the moisture from the donut was making the cardboard soften. So the whole box was coming adrift. It was coming apart. And this soldier said to her, as a scheiße gallop die Schachtel mitkommt, which means I couldn't give a dot, dot, dot if that box goes with you or not, implying that it wasn't going to do her much good where she was going. Now, he couldn't have had any idea whatsoever what was going to happen to her. All he knew was that it wasn't going to be anything good and 
Metaphorically speaking, he just wanted to twist the knife. But she ignored him. She got on the train. She arrives in Terezin. I'm now going to show two drawings of Terezin because I think they are more evocative of the sort of place that it was at the time. These drawings were done secretly by professional artists who themselves were prisoners. And the drawings were discovered quite by chance after the end of the war. They were discovered uh, buried under the floorboards or in cracks in the walls. People basically lived on bunks. They would try to make a niche, a den for themselves with a few personal belongings that they had been able to bring. That is the first time that those families would have been split up. So men were sent to one part, women to another part, elderly people to another part, children to yet another part. They were able to meet up sometimes during the day, but to a large extent they led separate lives. And when my mother arrived in Terezin, she was fortunate enough to be given a job. The jobs weren't paid or anything, but life was a bit easier if you had a job. And her job was working for the man who had the responsibility for sharing out the food. There wasn't much food there, but, but what there was, they tried to share out in a fair fashion. And that meant that she had access to food. And when I say she had access to food, she would steal. She would steal a potato, a carrot, an onion, just something with which to make a more substantial soup. And that was literally of vital importance because at one time my mother had the responsibility every single day for trying to find food for 15 members of her close family. Every single day. That was her main worry. What an, how on earth was she going to find enough food for all those people? And that was quite apart from the greater worry as to what on earth was going to happen to them all in the future. And amongst the people she was trying to find food for were her parents, my grandparents, Ida and Stanislav. And the next photograph shows my father as a young man with his mother, Selma. Now, my grandfather, Louis, was the only one of my four grandparents to have survived the war. And we believe there is a specific reason for that, although we don't actually have any proof. In the First World War, my grandfather was in the German army. In the First World War, my grandfather was given the Iron Cross First Class. That is the highest military honor that the Germans bestow upon their soldiers. And what happens to him in the Second World War? He's thrown into a concentration camp and most of his family is killed. He remained in Derezin throughout the war. And at the end of the war, he was found to be alive, just about. And via the Red Cross, contact was made between him and my uncle and aunt, who by that stage had returned from Switzerland to Holland. One day there was a knock on their door and there was my grandfather in the rags that he stood up in. And he lived with them for the rest of his life. And when I was a little girl, we used to go and visit them quite often. And it was very sad because I would come into the room and my grandfather couldn't see me because he had been blinded by the gas in the First World War. And he couldn't speak to me because he spoke German and Dutch and I only spoke Czech and English. Nevertheless, I'd come into the room, I'd give him a kiss, I'd say, I'd say, hello, grandfather. And he knew that I was the only surviving child in the family. This photograph may be familiar to you. It shows you the gateway to the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp in Poland. But before I start that part of the story, I have to tell you about two other things that happened to my parents in Terezin. To a large extent, Terezin was a transit camp for the death camps because there were various categories of people who would have been sent to their deaths quite quickly. And amongst those groups of people were the old, the sick, mothers with children, pregnant women, the mentally disabled, the physically disabled. They would have been sent to their deaths quite quickly. But because my parents were young, strong and well able to work, so they remained in Terezin for three years. That was remarkably long, a very unusually long period of time. But at the end of September of 1944, the luck ran out because it was on that day that my father was sent to Auschwitz. And incredibly, my mother actually volunteered to follow him the very next day. And the reason she volunteered to follow him was because, you know, she'd no idea where he'd been sent. And being the eternal optimist, she thought, well, as they had survived three years up to that point, she thought well, nothing could get any worse. Little did she know, but she thought nothing could get any worse. They would survive. But in fact, she never, ever saw my father again. And she heard from an eyewitness, a friend, quite soon after the end of the war, that my father had been shot dead on a death march near Auschwitz on the 18th of January, 1945. And Auschwitz was liberated by the Russian army 
on the 27th of January 1945. And that is why we commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January. Now, the second thing that I have to tell you about that happened to my parents in Terezin, you will appreciate is pretty important because it concerns my brother and his conception, me and my conception. I mentioned the fact that when families first arrived in Terezin, the sexes were segregated, men from women. But um, in 1943, my mother actually discovered that she was pregnant. And when I was about, I don't know, 12 or 13, no doubt when it would have been as most embarrassing, well, it's embarrassing at any age, I said to her, so how come you got pregnant to my father? And she replied in a very clever way. She said, well, she said, it was very, very, very dangerous. But your father and I got together secretly, as and when we could, and to hell with the consequences. End of story. But it was not the end of the story, and it had very, very serious consequences. Because to become pregnant in a concentration camp was considered by the Nazis to be a crime punishable by death. Because they were trying to annihilate, they were trying to murder every single member of the Jewish people. They couldn't prevent women coming into the camps pregnant. But the reason for the segregation was so that they could not become pregnant while there. And when the Nazis discovered that my mother and four other women were also pregnant, they made these five couples sign a document that said that when the babies were born, they would have to be handed over to be killed. Except they didn't use the word kill. They used the word euthanasia. My mother never heard the word euthanasia. She had to go and ask somebody what it meant. If you look it up in a dictionary, it'll say something like mercy killing. This would not have been mercy killing. This would have been murder. In the event the other four babies were born, we don't actually know what happened to those four families. We assume they all perished in Auschwitz. When my brother, Yezhi, Yezhi means George, he was born in February of 1944. He was not taken away from my parents, but he actually died of pneumonia two months later. And his death meant my life and my mother's life, which is a very strange thing to say. And the reason for that is that had my mother arrived in the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp holding my brother in her arms, they would have both been sent straight to the gas chamber. But because she arrived in Auschwitz not holding my brother, and although she was pregnant again, this time with me, nobody knew. She knew, but nobody else knew, and it didn't show. So again, she lived to see another day. Now, you might well have seen uh, images of how people were transported to the death camps. They were sent on trains, but these trains didn't consist of ordinary carriages. These trains consisted of cattle trucks. They were so crowded that people couldn't even sit down. There was hardly any air. There might have been a slat open at the top, and that was all. They were given no food and no water, and sometimes these journeys took several days. There were no toilet facilities. There might have been a bucket which would have been totally inadequate very quickly. So by the time the trains actually arrived in Auschwitz, invariably the people inside them would have been in a very poor mental and physical condition, especially the elderly and the children, because they had the least resistance, the least stamina. And when, family, when the trains first arrived in Auschwitz, the, and when the people got off the trains, that is the first time they had to go through what was called a selection. And selection always meant life or death. And my mother managed to get through a selection because she was still considered to be strong enough for work. And this was, you know, despite the fact she'd been somewhat malnourished during the previous three years. To give you an idea of my mother's physical strength, when she was 14 years of age, she was school's junior backstroke swimming champion of Czechoslovakia. And she always said that if this whole experience had to happen to her, she was at the right age, not only physically, but psychologically and emotionally. She was in her mid-twenties, she was tough, she was strong. Now, Auschwitz itself consisted of several different camps. Auschwitz I was brick-built, and that is where all the Polish prisoners were sent. And that is where today it is not only a place of memorial, but also <coughs> a museum where you have the collections. The collections of luggage, the collections of shoes, the collections of hair, the collections of spectacles, collections of pots and pans, all those things are in Auschwitz I. Auschwitz II, Auschwitz Birkenau, that is where all, that is a place purely of memorial. That is where all the Jews were sent and where all the Roma and Sinti were sent. 
This is a vast area right back to the tree line that would have been filled with wooden huts such as you can see in the foreground. But because Auschwitz-Birkenau is not preserved in any way until many years later, most of those wooden huts just disintegrated or the wood was stolen as firewood after the war. But what you can see in the distance quite accidentally makes for a very poignant, a very sad memorial for all those people who died, who were killed there. Because those uprights you can see, they are brick chimneys. They are nothing whatsoever to do with the crematoria, but they are brick chimneys. Because inside each of those huts, you would have had, you would have had two of those brick chimneys and they would have been joined together by a brick tun tunnel. And there was a grate at either end and the idea was that you'd have fuel that you burn in the grate and the heat generator would pass along the tunnel, thereby giving warmth to the hut. But of course they weren't given any fuel, their lives were meant to be at all comfortable. So it is a very poignant memorial because there are hundreds of those brick chimneys. These huts were incredibly crowded. Some of them before the war might have been stables that would have had say 60 or 70 horses. But at the time that I'm talking about, they housed hundreds and hundreds of people. 500, 800, even up to 1,000 people. And when my mother and her friends arrived in a hut like this, they were so frightened and so bewildered. They just couldn't work out what this place was. And they said to the women there, what happens here? What goes on here? When will we see our families again? And the women actually laughed at them because they couldn't understand that anybody arriving in Auschwitz would have no idea what went on there. And they said, well, we'll all go up in smoke and you never see your families again. And in that instant, they knew what went on there. People were given hardly any sustenance on a daily basis. They were given a sort of black oily liquid in the morning, which is called coffee. And they were given another liquid in the evening, which is called soup. And if they're very lucky, perhaps they might have been able to dredge up the odd potato peeling from the bottom of the bucket. And they were given one piece of bread. That is all they were given. So an awful lot of people just died of starvation and you would often wake up to find corpses on either side of you. Now, apart from the selections, the other thing that happened at least twice daily was called the appel. Appel means registration. Sounds like a very mild sort of word, doesn't it? What it actually meant was that every day at four o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening, everybody would have to stand outside their hut to be counted. And if the numbers didn't tally, they would just have to stand there till they did or until there was some sort of explanation. And my mother said it was very, very hard to stand stock still for hours and hours on end, regardless of the weather. And she tried to keep as low a profile as you could because you had no idea how the Nazis might react to you if for some reason you drew attention to yourself. And my mother actually fainted several times during these appels, and that could have been very bad news for her. But she was always so relieved to find that when she came round, to find that she was actually being held up by her friends on either side, which meant that she hadn't sunk to the ground, she hadn't drawn attention to herself, and again, she lived to see another day. Now this photograph shows you a selection on arrival. In the far distance, that long row of people, they are walking to the gas chambers to their deaths, but they don't know that. In the foreground, the longer row of people are men, the shorter row are women and they are walking towards a group of Nazi officers where they will be selected for life or death. And my mother distinctly remembered one of these selections where Dr. Mengele was presiding. Dr. Mengele was one of the, the most notorious Nazi officers. He was a medical doctor who actually specialized in appalling experiments upon pregnant women, upon sets of twins, upon um, babies, all of that. And my mother remembered hearing him say, these are my sehr gutes Material, which means this time we have very good material in front of us, not people, units of slave labor. They did not consider the people in front of them as being human beings. So my three other grandparents, my two aunts, my cousin Peter, and most of the other members of the extended family, they were all sent to Auschwitz a long time before my own parents were. What I <clears throat> hadn't mentioned was the fact that uh, when people first arrived in Auschwitz and at their selection, if they were chosen to be well enough for work, various procedures happened to them. They were told if they'd managed to bring any luggage with them, to put their suitcases on the ground, to write their names on them, that they would be reunited with them later, but of course they weren't. They then were 
sent into real showers. Well, at this stage, they had absolutely no idea at all that anything other than a real shower existed, the gas chamber. They also had all their hair shaved. They also were given that sort of striped uniform and a pair of shoes, if they were lucky. And then they were tattooed with a number on their arms. And it was after that that they were sent into huts. Now, when all the rest of my family arrived in Auschwitz, none of those initial procedures took place. They were able to keep their luggage, they kept their clothes, they weren't shaved, they weren't tattooed. And they were sent to what was called a familia lager. That meant a family camp. All it meant was that one or two of those huts had families together. And there was just one very cynical reason why. And that was so that they could be forced to write postcards home. And my aunt, the lady wearing the yellow star in that earlier photograph, she wrote this postcard to her cousin, who still happened to be in Prague. They were made to write these postcards home for purposes of propaganda and deception. This is the front of the postcard that my aunt, the one who's wearing the yellow star, she wrote to her cousin still in Prague. And I want you to note her birthday, which is in the top left hand corner, which is the 21st of March 1904. Above that, it says her full name, Sidonie Isidore because she'd married that man in the first photograph. Underneath her date of birth, it says Birkenau. But on the right-hand side, where the name Olga should be, because that was the first name of her cousin in Prague, my aunt was desperate to get a message out in code. She got the message out, it was understood, it was acted upon. Instead of having the word Olga there, there is the word Lechem, which is neither Czech nor German, the word lechem is Hebrew and it means bread. And my aunt was telling her cousin they were starving. Her cousin understood, her cousin even sent a parcel, but the contents of it would have been stolen long before it got anywhere near them. And I'm afraid I have to tell you that even before the postcard was sent from Auschwitz to Prague, they were all dead, all of them. I'm now going to show you the text of the postcard that they had to be written in German so the Germans could censor them. My dear ones, I'm here with my husband, my sister and my nephew. All are well and in good health. My husband received a parcel yesterday from our housekeeper and I would ask you to confirm this to her. Please also thank Gerti. Could she greet Birza Schmidt for us? I hope you're well and happy. Your parents are very well at the time of our departure. Right soon. Peter looks well. Peter's my eight-year-old cousin. Peter looks well and looks forward to receiving news from you. Greetings and kisses. Yours, Dena. So, as I say, that it sounds like, you know, having a wonderful time, wish you were here. And that's when she thought of writing the, the code word. My mother was fortunate enough to be in Auschwitz for, in quotes, only 10 days. But she said that those 10 days were hell on earth. She said it was like Dante's Inferno. But after 10 days, because she was deemed to be still strong enough for work, so she was sent out of Auschwitz to a slave labor camp, to an almonds factory in Germany, in a place called Freiburg, which is near um, Dresden in Saxony, where she was working on this. This is the V1, the unmanned flying bomb. In this country, it was nicknamed the Doodlebug. When they came into the factory, the first impression that they had was one of bedbugs. The place was crawling on the floors, on the ceiling, on the walls, and they were delighted. And they were delighted because it meant that there was some food there, not much. And it also meant that there was some warmth there, again, not much. And they very quickly ascertained but there were no gas chambers there. After a few days, they weren't quite so pleased when the bugs started to bite, but after what they had been through in Auschwitz, it was negligible. Now, unknown to my mother, she was to spend the next six months in Freiburg. That is from October of 1944 to the end of March, the beginning of April of 1945, and the end of the war in Europe was the 8th of May. And during those six months, she was becoming progressively more and more starved and more and more obviously pregnant. 
which was very dangerous for her. But fortunately, none of the Germans realized she was pregnant until it was too late to send her back to Auschwitz to be killed because Auschwitz had been liberated. We do know of cases of women who were found to be uh, pregnant before Auschwitz had liberated. They were sent back there. And Mengele took the most unspeakable revenge on them because he felt they'd got away with it. And during the six months that my mother was in Freiburg, that is when the Allied bombing raids of Dresden took place. Uh, I imagine some of you might know that there's been a lot of controversy about those raids ever since. But I hope that you will appreciate that in this particular context, I'm talking to you from my mother's very, very personal perspective. And from her perspective, the raids were just fantastic. What happened when the air raid started was uh, the prisoners, the Nazis locked all the prisoners in the factory and they went to the air raid shelters. And the prisoners, even though they knew the next bomb could fall on them and kill a lot of them, nevertheless, they were very pleased because they realized it was the Allies and they hoped and prayed that it wouldn't be too much longer before they were actually rescued. And this is where my father-in-law comes into the story very, very indirectly. My father-in-law, Kenneth Clark, he was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force. He was a navigator. He was in bomber command and he was on the Dresden raids. And after the war, when he first met my mother, well, a long term after the war, when my husband and I became engaged and the two families got together, and when he heard my mother tell what had happened to her, he was absolutely devastated at the thought that he could have actually killed her, which he could have done. Now, you might be able to see one of the lines in this logbook, and that reads, on the 13th of the 2nd, 45, the 13th of February, 1945, 1740 hours, 20 to 6 in the evening, and then you can see Lancaster, that was the aeroplane, and on the right-hand side, you can see the word Dresden. So he really could have killed her. At the end of March, the beginning of April of 1945, this is when the Germans were realizing they were losing the war. And this is where, when they began to evacuate the camps. They were trying to empty the camps of living witnesses as to what had been going on inside the camps. And this is when the notorious death marches happened. My mother wasn't on a death march, but she was put on yet another train. But this time it didn't consist of a cattle truck. This time it consisted of a coal wagon, open to the skies and filthy, and would have looked something like this. My mother was on a train like this with 2,000 other prisoners for 17 days with no food and hardly any water. And after the war, when similar trains were discovered, they were discovered to just have piles of corpses in them. And during this 17-day nightmare of a journey, the train was stopped, the doors are open, the dead bodies thrown out, and a farmer walked by, and he saw my mother, and he had such a shock. My mother described herself as looking like a scarcely living pregnant skeleton. She weighed five stone, that is 35 kilograms, and she was nine months pregnant. And this farmer brought her a glass of milk, but there was a Nazi officer standing near her and he had a whip and he raised his whip to shoulder height as if to beat my mother if she accepted the glass of milk. But he didn't. He lowered his arm, he didn't say anything and he let her have the glass of milk. She maintained that saved her life. Who knows? Perhaps it did. And the train went on. And it eventually arrived in this place called Mauthausen. Mauthausen itself is a beautiful village on the banks of the Danube in Austria, near Linz. A concentration camp was up the steep hill behind the village. And when my mother saw the name Mauthausen, she had such a shock. Because as opposed to when she'd arrived in Auschwitz, not knowing what that was, this time she knew, because she had heard about this appalling place from very early on in the war. The main form of torture in Mauthausen was that the fact that prisoners had to work all daylight hours in a stone quarry. The photograph that you will see shows hundreds of people on those steps, all carrying large blocks of stone that they've had to dig out of the quarry. And so many people died or were killed on those steps that the prisoners themselves nicknamed them the stairway of death. They are very steep. I have seen them. I have been on them. 
And she said the shock was so great that she always thought that it possibly, probably provoked the onset of her labour. And she started to give birth to me on that coal wagon. She had to climb off the coal wagon unaided. She had to climb onto a cart because the prisoners who were not strong enough to walk up the hill to the camp, they had to get onto carts and they were pulled up by others. She had people lying all over her, people with typhus and typhoid fever. And she proceeded to give birth to me. And there was another Nazi officer who saw that she was in the midst of child labor. And he said to her, Du kannst weiter schreien, which means you can carry on screaming, because presumably she had been. And she always said that she was screaming not only because she was in labor, but because she thought this was her very last minute on this earth. She thought she was about to die. But we both survived the experience. I was born, I didn't move, I didn't breathe. Uh, incredibly, the Germans allowed a doctor to come to my mother, a doctor who was also a prisoner. And presumably they allowed it because they could hear the guns in the distance. And the doctor came and he cut the umbilical cord and he smacked me to make me cry, to make me breathe. And there are three reasons why we survived. And the first is a very chilling one. On the 28th of April, 1945, the Nazis had run out of gas for the gas chamber. Well, my birthday is the 29th. So presumably had the train arrived on the 26th or 27th, again, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be talking to you now. The second indirect reason why we survived was because on the 30th of April, Hitler committed suicide. And the last and the best reason why we survived was because on the 5th of May, the American army liberated the camp. My mother reckoned she wouldn't have last, lasted much longer. They think I weighed three pounds. A three pound baby nowadays is put straight into an incubator. There were no incubators. Or perhaps I had the best incubator. My mother just held me all the time. I now have two images of my mother and myself taken by an American GI uh, in Mauthausen. My mother sadly never saw these photographs. Um, she always told me that hundreds and hundreds of photographs were taken of us by the American soldiers. But although I really tried to find them, I never was able to. Wendy Holden, the author of Born Survivor, she found this and she sent it to me, it's on a part of a cine film that a, a GI soldier had taken a record of his campaign trail through Europe. And this is these are the very last two images on that film. And she took a, a screenshot and sent it to me. She said, is this your mother? And I said, yes, I think so. Now, when the Americans arrived, they had food and they had medicine, but you probably know it is very, very dangerous to give starved people food because their bodies just cannot take it. And my mother spoke fluent English and she tried to tell as many people as possible who didn't what the Americans were saying. They were saying to eat very, very slowly and very small amounts. But you can imagine, can't you, that if you've been starved for months and years and suddenly you're handed an American chocolate Hershey bar, you tend to scoff the lot. And an awful lot of people at that stage collapsed and died. But one hopes that perhaps some of them, a few of them, might have realized that they were actually free. When some of the prisoners who were strong enough, they're pulling down the Nazi emblem, the eagle with the swastika underneath. Now, after about three weeks when my mother was strong enough to travel, the Americans asked her if she wanted to be repatriated to Prague. She did. And so we were put on yet another train, an ordinary train this time. And we arrived back in Prague and it was at night and it was dark. And my mother said that was the worst moment of her three and a half years incarceration in camps. Because up to that moment, she'd never allowed herself to think as to what had probably happened to all the rest of the family. She, she just never let herself think about it. But you know, arriving at your home station, you wonder if there might be anybody there to meet you. And of course there wasn't. But nevertheless, she still had a vestige of optimism at the back of her mind. And she thought that if any other member of the family had survived, there was a chance it might be her cousin, the lady who received the postcard. My aunt had come back from Terezin, the first camp, a few days before we came back from Mauthausen. And my aunt had even, even heard on the grapevine 
that my mother had survived and that incredibly she had a baby. My mother asked somebody to give us some money to go on the tram. We arrived at my aunt's flat and my mother was a very practical woman and the first words she said to my aunt were, we haven't got any lice. Well, we were riddled with lice and we had scabies, which I think we had. And the second thing she said was, please, could we stay for a few days to recover? Well, we actually stayed for three years. And that was fantastic because we had our own family support group. It was a tiny family because we were almost the only survivors from what had been a very large extended family. And because my mother was given closure quite soon after the end of the war, when she was told of the death of my father. So three years later, she was able to consider a new life and a new marriage. And this is where my stepfather comes into the story. My stepfather, Kara Bergman, he was also Czech and also Jewish. And like my uncle, he'd managed to escape in 39. He got to the UK, he joined the RAF. He was too old to be trained as a pilot. But because he spoke languages, he was made an official interpreter. And after the war, he came back to Prague to pick up the pieces of his family, most of whom had also been killed in Auschwitz. And he met my mother, whom he had known as a family friend before the war. And they decided to get married. And they also decided to leave because this was now 1948. And that is when the communists took over and they did not want to live under communist regime. And so we came to this country. And although we came legally, I would like to stress, we might have come as refugees, we might have come as asylum seekers, we might have come as migrants. We arrived in this country and fortunately my f stepfather got a job quite quickly in South Wales and as a result I grew up in Cardiff. Uh, this is a photograph of us taken in Cardiff going to my first school prize giving where my mother shed a lot of tears. Well, all parents and grandparents shed tears at prize givings, but I think she might have cried a bit, a bit more because unknown to her, I was about to receive a prize for reading and I hadn't spoken a word of English the previous year. But again, I'm sure you know that little children uh, learn other languages very quickly. Yes, I imagine you might have, you might realize I've changed a bit. Um, I don't have the plaits anymore. I do have them, but they're a different color. This is a photograph of my mother on her 95th birthday. Not bad for 95. This is my four generation photograph. I have two sons and they have three now four children between them. And my mother could never, never get over the fact that she'd survived her wartime experiences that I survived. And that she lived till the age of 96. And so she saw her three great grandchildren. This book, Born Survivors, it was written by Wendy Holden, who was a former journalist. She was on the Telegraph. She was a war correspondent. She was in Iraq, amongst other places. And after about 18 years, she had enough of seeing life and death, and she decided to become a biographer. And some years ago, she wrote this book. This is called Born Survivors, and it tells the story of three young mothers all of whom arrived in Auschwitz pregnant, all of whom were in the Freiburg slave labor camp, all of whom were on that horrendous train journey for 17 days. And all three of us were born in April of 1945 in the most dire of circumstances. And all six of us survived, all three mothers, all three babies, none of the fathers. This is when we first met, 65th anniversary of the commemoration of the end of the war. Thank you very much for listening to my story and I hope that you will all remember what happened in the Holocaust. To leave the GDR during the Cold War was my knowledge. But my longing for freedom, and it was so unjustified, gave me the energy and the absolute conviction and willingness to try it.